This is a radiometer. It spins when you shine light on it. But I have to do something in the name of science. Hey, that wasn't that bad. And now to punch some holes in it like this. So to understand why I have the urge to punch a bunch of holes in a nice new radiometer, let's go back to the start. Okay, toilet paper roll. No, further than that. It's 1873, Sir William Crookes noticed while weighing some samples in an evacuated chamber that when he shined light on the samples, it moved them slightly. Just a few years earlier, Maxwell had come out with his famous equations describing how electromagnetic fields worked and that light could actually produce a pressure when it hit objects called radiation pressure. He thought that this is one of the first demonstrations of this new radiation pressure. So he made the device work even better by making veins that could spin and making one side black and one side white. Now it was a brilliant device for the time, but he was way off in explaining how it worked. It turns out that radiation pressure is way too weak of a force to turn the veins. And also the vein should spin in the opposite direction if it was radiation pressure. This is because the recoil force of the light on the white side is much more than the absorption force on the black side. Over the next hundred years, physicists tried to figure out how it worked, but so far they just found out how it didn't work. We know it doesn't turn due to off-gassing from the black material because it stops working in an extremely low vacuum. It also doesn't turn because the pressure is higher on the black side due to being hotter. This is because the hot gas would have the same pressure as the cool gas, but just at a lower density. But Einstein found this wasn't exactly true. He found that right near the edges, the pressures don't cancel out perfectly. But after some calculations of the forces predicted by Einstein, it was found that it could turn the veins slightly, but it didn't account for the main movement of the veins. It was much too weak of a force. So what is it then? Well, currently the most widely accepted theory is that the radiometer moves due to something called thermal creep or thermal transpiration. This is a force that arises due to the fact that the hot air on the black side is moving faster than the cold air on the cold side. It creates a force right on the edge of the vein. Literally, the small perimeter of the vein is where all the forces arise. So thermal transpiration is what's accepted by most physicists. But this leads to a lot of other questions. If the main driving force is from the edges, why don't we just make more edges, like punch holes in the veins, or make slits so that there are more edges? Will it work better? Also, if it's an edge effect, wouldn't the radiometer work better if we shine light just near the edges than the whole vein? So I'm going to be doing these experiments and see what we find out. But before we continue, I'd like to thank BetterHelp for sponsoring this video. These last few years have been difficult for everyone, and one of the most important things you can do in times like this is to focus on your mental health. BetterHelp is the world's largest therapy service, and it's 100% online. With BetterHelp, you can tap into a network of over 30,000 licensed and experienced therapists who can help you with a wide range of issues. To get started, you just answer a few questions about your needs and preferences in therapy. That way, BetterHelp can match you with the right therapist from their network. Then you can talk to your therapist however you feel comfortable, whether it's via text, chat, phone, or video call. You can message your therapist anytime and schedule a live session when it's convenient for you. And if your therapist isn't the right fit for you for any reason, you can switch to a new therapist at no additional charge as well. With BetterHelp, you get the same professionalism and quality you expect from in-office therapy, but with a therapist who's custom-picked for you, more scheduling flexibility at a more affordable price. So get 10% off your first month at betterhelp.com slash actionlab, or you can click the link in the description. And thanks to BetterHelp for sponsoring this video. Now let's get back to our experiment. Now this is under a low vacuum inside of here, so there's gonna be an implosion when I break it. So hopefully this will contain it enough. Let's see if I can not destroy everything by the implosion. Let's see what happens. Oh man. So let's see if this actually spins outside of the vacuum of the globe. So even with 100,000 lumens, it doesn't spin in regular air. But let's see if we can lower the pressure around it and get it to spin. This is because the mean free path of the air molecules is much too small compared to the width of the vein. So we have to lower the air pressure in order to get a larger mean free path so that they can bump into the edges of the vein and make it spin. So my pressure inside the chamber is at zero bar, as low as I can read.
Okay, it's completely stopped. Let's turn on our light. At 100,000 lumen, it does start to spin. The fastest I can get it to spin is around one revolution in seven seconds. But now let's test if giving it more edges will make it spin even faster. So I'm just gonna cut it down the center. So this is about a 70% increase in edges. So let's see if we can have an increase in speed now. So we're at the same pressure now. And I shine 100,000 lumens on it again. So it's now at the maximum speed. So at its maximum speed, I get around one revolution for eight seconds. So for some reason with more edges, it didn't actually spin faster. A little disappointing that it didn't increase more. Maybe we messed up the drag of the veins too much by changing its shape. So instead of cutting them, let's punch our holes in them. I told you this would make sense soon. And nothing. I can't even get this one to spin for some reason. So this is disappointing. Maybe the static friction is just too much to overcome so we can't see the big differences here. But either way, this didn't really help confirm that it's thermal transpiration that's making a Crookes radiometer turn. But I have something else up my sleeve to try. These veins are actually just made out of paper so they don't transfer heat very easily. So what if we only heat up near the edges? Will that spin better than if I heat up at the center of the veins? If I use my thermal camera, you can see that I can localize the heat on the vein using a violet laser. So let's see how long it takes to do one revolution on a normal radiometer if I just shine the laser on the center of one vein. And go. Okay, now I'm gonna shine it on the top corner with the full beam still being there and see how long it takes to do one full rotation. And go. Okay, center. In three, two, one. The bottom 90 degree angle. Three, two, one. It looks like they both took about the same amount of time. The reason for this is because even though I can locally heat the vein, that doesn't mean that the heat stays local in the air. Remember that it's the air that's moving the vein. I'm guessing that the heat diffuses all around the vein quickly so that it doesn't matter whether I'm just heating the edge of the vein or the center. So both of my experiments didn't really confirm that thermal transpiration is the mechanism that makes the Crookes radiometer turn. But when something is argued about for hundreds of years between geniuses like Einstein, Reynolds, and Maxwell, it usually means that it's a difficult problem. I found some researchers that made a version of a radiometer that doesn't have white and black on either side of the veins, but they're actually side by side, and it still spins. This would also fit in with the thermal transpiration theory. I'll put a link to that paper in my description as well. So what's your guess? Do you think we've fully described how the Crookes radiometer works, or are we still missing something? And thanks for watching another episode of the Action Lab, and we'll see you next time.